This webinar was given by Dr. Nordquist on Wednesday, March 21, 2018, concerning prions, viruses, chronic systemic disease, and dentistry. This time frame was two years before the great COVID-19 incident started and is important because it was about this same time, great discoveries were being made linking prion diseases to the Sphinx virus. After viewing this presentation, go back and listen to Dr. Nordquist's presentation, The Sphinx Virus aka The God Virus, which puts the significance of the Sphinx virus in perspective to modern-day chronic diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease, mad cow disease, and diabetes. The link to this video will be placed below in the description. As we go along in this presentation, we will interrupt the video to point out the latest discoveries made since 2018. The lecture is broken into two parts. Part 1 describes the background leading to the formation of the microbial imbalance starting in the mouth. This disparity leads to an overpopulation of spirochetes in the oral dental plaque. Once spirochetes become overpopulated, they cause immune suppression which results in the phenomenon called modern chronic disease. Part 2 details the meat of the lecture concerning the interaction of spirochetes, viruses, prions, beta amyloid, their use as bioweapons, producing immune suppression, and chronic diseases. This lecture introduces the possibility of reversing these diseases, but the detail of reversal is revealed in previous material. The links to which are located below in the description. Now to the webinar. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's AOSH webinar. My name is Ashley Height, and presenting tonight's webinar is Dr. William Nordquist, who is a dentist, oral biologist, researcher, writer, and speaker. And he's here to talk to us about the pathogenic mechanisms that connect oral health, diabetes, and Alzheimer's disease, among others. So thank you for joining us tonight, Dr. Nordquist. Okay, can you still see the, the webinar on the side? Nope, we can't see that. You're, you are good to go. Um, before we begin though, I'd like to remind everyone that there will be time to address questions at the end of his presentation. So go ahead and enter any que questions that you might have into the panel on the uh, GoToWebinar panel. So with that, I will turn the mic over to you, Dr. Norquist. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Nordquist, and here I am on my boat in San Diego, California, and it's it's sunny right now, but we're going to have some rain later tomorrow. But this subject that we're going to be dealing with is prions, viruses, their re, um, relationship to systemic disease and the implications to dentistry. So there's a lot of material here, and I'm assuming that uh, many of you have some knowledge of this subject. So to get through this whole thing in an hour, I have to move along pretty rapidly. So this is going to be evidently you can access this for credit uh, from now on so that you can go back and review it if you want to. So we'll get started. Here we go. This is actually based on a paper that we just, just published. And uh, it was Dentistry Today, and it went out as a news report. And um, you can access that by going to Dentistry Today and just look at page through their uh, news reports and you'll find this lecture or you'll find the paper that this lecture is based on. So we're going to talk about the first I'm going to give some examples. There's just three quick examples of patients with chronic disease and how we mitigated it. And everything that we're going to talk about has to do with the balance of bacteria or the microbial garden, not only from the oral cavity, but throughout the gut, from the mouth to the, the anus. And then quite a bit of information on what I think is the, the underlying microbe that seems to be the instigator and the carrier of the, the viruses that seem to be doing the alteration. And we're gonna talk about how the garden gets altered. And uh, then at the last part, we're going to get into the meat of the paper. It's um, herpes virus and then uh, the relationship between Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, and CJD. And then we're going to get into the virus or the spirochetes and viruses and how the spirochetes carry the viruses and, and then the prion theory and prion diseases. And so here we go. Here's some patients that uh, have these chronic diseases. If you notice this patient uh, has alopecia, no hair, and she was referred to me. And so we did our little hygiene thing and we were able to, within six months, uh, she started growing her eyebrows and her eyelashes back. And I'm not taking credit for it because this is an anecdotal 
just one case. But um, it gives you a really good feeling to be able to treat some of these chronic diseases successfully. And it makes your day, believe me, when you see something like this in six months. Here's a patient and she happens to be the husband of one of my editors. And she's a very, very smart person, uh, Bonnie Bennett. And she wrote a book, Tick Bites and MS. And it goes into a lot of the stuff that I'm gonna go in. But they called and said, my husband has been going blind over the last few months and he's totally blind in his right eye. And, I, and she thought it was caused by spirochetes that are probably coming from the mouth. So I told her, I said, get your butts over here and we'll get um, a microbial analysis or a microscopic examination and, and a CAT scan to find out if there's a source of infection in his mouth. And so we did a CBCT and lo and behold, we found tooth number three uh, completely abscessed. And um, I referred her back or him back to Tucson where they had an oral surgeon who went in and cleaned that whole mess up and said it was one of the worst abscesses that he'd ever treated. And um, also she put him on doxycycline, which she feels is very important in treating these spirochetes, but long-term doxycycline. And within six months, he totally regained the sight in his eye. And here's another patient that came in and um, one of my associates had uh, treated him first and he actually did a root canal on number three here with just regular x-rays. And the regular uh, x-rays didn't show anything. Uh, there was no sign of, of sinus involvement whatsoever. And that was on a, on a Wednesday or was on a Thursday. And I happened to be in that office on Friday and she came in and she basically had Ludwig's angina. She still could breathe, but we got her to the hospital, uh, got her on IV antibiotics and they swelling down and then we got a CAT scan and we could see this huge area of infection, which involved basically uh, three teeth, two, three, and four. And so we did root canals on two and four and extracted number three, and now uh, she's doing really well now. But anyway, what we're gonna be talking about is the balance of bacteria or balance of microbes from the oral cavity to the anus. And it's a, something that's actually gone haywire in our modern society. And we're gonna give some, some answers as actually how this garden got so screwed up, to be honest with you. But anyway, the alteration of the human microbiota, we're gonna talk about antibiotics, diet, and human migration. My co-author, uh, Dr. Krutchkoff, and I wrote a paper about what's called the metagenome and um, its relationship to periodontal disease as Connecticut Journal, Dental Journal, and you can go find that if you want to. But it goes into what happens over a lifetime of dealing with microbes and then microbes that are out of balance. And you accumulate these bacteria or these uh, microbial and microbial particles and over a lifetime and pretty soon it overwhelms the immune system and um, it depresses the immune system, which leads to these chronic diseases. Probably the biggest clue that I ever had for understanding this balance is this book called Missing Microbes. And I highly recommend you find this book and, and read it and study it because Brasler really has insight into what happens when we alter the microbes. And he was dealing with H. pylori, the, the microbe that causes ulcers and stomach ulcers, uh, ulcers and stomach cancer. And over a 20 year period, is he had the particular microbe. And he did experiments in uh, over a 20 year period and decided, and he and his colleagues decided that H. pylori wasn't so bad. And if we take it away, then you get heartburn. And so he felt that the inflammation that so-called was caused by this microbe was actually a normal reaction in the gut. And the, the inflama inflammatory cells were actually part of the immune system. And he goes into the long, beautifully written book about how the um, immune system uses these microbes to, mo to modulate the immune attack. And without those inflammatory cells, the body cannot modulate the immune attack uh, according to whatever microbe a patient is exposed to. So the microbial garden, actually 20% of the DNA in the body is actually human. 80% represents bacteria, virus, viral and fungus DNA. 
And this uh, garden needs to be tended properly. Things that interfere with it is the uh, modern diet, uh, the effects of antibiotics, and the need to use probiotics. So with, with that in mind, I began to think, well, what is plaque? Is, uh, um, if inflammation is good in the gut, maybe plaque is the same, has the same function and the immune system to, to govern or to modulate the immune system in its attack starting for the oral cavity. And so for years, I've, I've been uh, looking at high powered micro, microscopy of plaque. And I have to admit, throughout all those years, I didn't see the trees for the bugs that were any running around. And I didn't see the forest for the microbes. And so when you're looking at plaque samples, normal plaque samples, and if you do this over a long period of time, you find that the vast majority of what you see on a microscopic examination of dental plaque are PMNs, they're immune cells. And so I'm thinking to myself, wow, this, this is something that is normal in the mouth and is part of the immune system. These the, uh, PMNs, polymorphic nuclear cells, are actually serving the same purpose of sensing what you're exposed to and then modulating the immune system accordingly. To summarize this section in plain English, Dr. Nordquist, after reading Blasser's book on missing microbes in the stomach subsequent to using a course of antibiotics, he had questions concerning the potential problem after using strong mouthwash and or aggressive cleanings and or using lasers by dentists to kill so-called bad bacteria. By doing so, doesn't this affect the bacterial balance further down the gut to the stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and the colon? Maybe we should rethink the whole process of dental care with the idea of balancing microbes in the mouth rather than killing them? So, microbial alteration and immune suppression, just to give you an example of what this, how, how severe this problem is, I've got, I ask, I get this so simple, I can ask my questions, three simple questions. And I ask also health professionals, physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, and, and anyone interested in, in the immune system and um, how antibiotics affect the body. And I tell them, they're going to ask three questions, riddle, and all questions have the same answer. But by the time you get to the second question, most people that know the most about this cannot answer that second question. The first question, I ask the question, what is the most important discovery in modern medicine that probably resulted in the formation of big pharma? And I would say 90% or better will answer antibiotics. So then... We now know from literature and from all the research I did, and, and the literature backs this up, is that chronic disease, that includes all the major diseases we have in our modern society, are caused by an imbalance from the oral cavity to the anus. So the question is, what's the primary cause of the imbalance? And then question three, if, if this is causing and the imbalance, and this has been going on since its discovery after World War II, how many people have died from, let's say, the top four? You know, diabetes, heart disease, the neurologic disease, and most cancers are from chronic inflammation. So what single thing has caused more deaths since World War II than almost anything else? And so that answer is antibiotics. So we as dentists, <laughs> We use antibiotics all the time. It is my board certifications in plant dentistry, and my practice was limited um, to implant dentistry from the late 80s until about five years ago when I started phasing out of it. So spirochetes are not sensitive to antibiotic treatment. So when you treat patients with antibiotics, even one course, and the more courses, the more uh, bacteria and, and microbes become extinct forever. And so that balance is disturbed and they potentiate spirochetes. So there are several things that changed since World War II. And basically, when we all left Africa thousands of years ago, we basically all had the same microbes in our mouth because we all came from the same where. So over thousands of years, we spread all around the world and we became isolated in our little small communities everywhere. And the strains over many, many years changed. 
So after World War II, when travel, you know, cars, planes, and automobiles came along, we started mixing our oral bacteria together. And so it depends on your, how robust your immune system is to the particular strain that has changed that you now have. So the modern diet adds another thing, and the, we find that the refined carbohydrate that turned to sugar as soon as they turn in your mouth and sugar and the whole thing is started sometime at the same time. So what's the literature say? We, of course, everyone in this webinar knows about uh, Weston Price's work, so I don't have to really go over it. But he basically went to every indigenous population around the world, and he found that people not exposed to modern society didn't have cavities and they didn't have facial deformities. So sugar consumption in this country, you can see how it's dramatically increased and spirochetes seem to thrive and they need the, the more sugar, the more being out of balance already, the more populated they become. These next three, slot, three videos are patient that taught me more about the immune system than any other patient. And it was just a fluke that I discovered this. But a patient came in that just had an abscess teeth, but his no periodontal disease anywhere. He came in, he wanted, because he heard about my lectures and he said, I want to check my spirochetes. I said, well, we don't really need to. We just have an abscess tooth. You know, we just take it out, clean it up and you're good to go. And he says, but I want to get it changed. I want to have my plaque checked anyway with your microscope. So I did, and this is what I found. This was from the Exudate. And those little round things we're going to talk about later, they are the spore-like forms that the body, when you have an abscessed tooth, can go in and deal with the infection, then it moves it outside the body through a uh, draining abscess. When you look at the PMNs in these situations, I hope you can see that the, every one of those PMMs is loaded with microbes. And you can see spirochetes. Right there is a spirochete, and uh, it's almost in the point where it's turning into its circular form here. And so I've never seen this before. I've been studying slides like this for years and I never saw a microbe in any immune cell ever. So this was a revelation to me that this is the immune system the way it's supposed to work. So if you just take a plaque sample, you can have just microbes. There are spirochetes in there, the trichinomes, there are all kinds of amoeba and other things, but there, all of the immune cells are impotent. And we, what I found out later in my studies that the, these particular microbes, the spirochetes and then several others can actually commandeer the immune system and depress it so that they can survive and other bacteria can too. We found that or over years and through the literature studies that spirochetes, uh, chlamydia pneumonia and a few others actually can commandeer the immune system. And we find that and the literature backs this up that spirochetes, when you have bleeding gums and bone loss, that they uh, can get up to 80% of the microbes that you can see. And they hijack the immune system and they produce immune suppression. Immune suppression is a common denominator among the spectrum of chronic inflammatory diseases. When we're talking about the chronic diseases, so we used to call them autoimmune diseases, it's quite an array. And if one what patient has one, they usually have many, even if they're subclinical. So if they have heart disease, chances are they may have undiagnosed diabetes and array of over, uh, there's almost a hundred other named chronic inflammatory diseases. They're all comorbid with each other. And when you study plaque, there's huge number of factors from the recent studies with DNA. There's, there's twice as many microbes in the, the mouth than what we once saw. And most of them, half of them cannot be cultured or characterized or named. When you get Gingivitis, uh, research has shown that one third of the human genome is activated. The mouth is the primary battle for the immune system to conquer whatever it's exposed to while still in the mouth. Nowhere else in the body can you have a open wound year after year after year without getting grain, gain green. So if you've got an infection in your leg or something like that and it went on for more than a few days, you're going to start getting a septicemia and you may get gangrene and lose a limb, but not so in the mouth. Periodontal disease and chronic systemic inflammation. The problem is, is how do you diagnose them? A lot of, I see a lot of papers are blaming one bacteria or another or trying to figure it out. And it's really hard to diagnose. I mean, we're doing it with traditional probing and 
bleeding points and you know, all this stuff actually causes back, dangerous bacteremias. There's plenty of literature to show that. What we know, there's too many, many bacteria for DNA tests and we don't even know half of them are. So right now, the only way you can really appraise it is with a microscope until we get DNA tests, at least of the, the major players, which we don't even know what they are. I'm going to now get into why I've been writing so much about spirochetes or morphology, the pleomorphic forms, and how they actually evade the immune system. Some of this research goes back many, many years. And I, when I first started understanding this, I couldn't understand how we've overlooked this. So spirochetes actually have many forms. And as they start out, they start out, you know, the, the spiral forms. And then as they get older, they form little granules in anywhere from 16 to 18. And the research has shown that these little granules actually will vegetate and turn into active the spiral uh, forms. And there's a, what we call a cis form, Ellen McDonald. He's been probably the most influential of all the researchers in this subject. He feels that these cis forms actually do, do stimulate the immune system and cause inflammation. So spirochetes get to wherever they're going to go. It's usually in this lining of blood vessels. And it, if you want to really get down to it, all these chronic diseases are really vascular diseases because most of the damage and where they incubate and cause inflammation is in the lining of blood vessels. These are what Lyme disease spirochetes look like. And so when you're doing your microbial analysis with a microscope, you look for the spirochetes that kind of move like snakes. Here's one right here. They move like snakes. And here's a, a lymphocyte that's actually engulfing one of these things. And so when you're looking at plaque, here's, here's um, this is the Lyme spirochete. And then as soon as this shows, I'm going to show two samples that I took from patients that have the same movement and the same coils as the Lyme disease spirochete in dental plaque. Here's the first patient. And as you see, most of them are, or some of them are moving like snakes. And that's one of the clues as to how virulent a particular spirochete is. Here's another patient. So the when a spirochete is engulfed within a macrophage, there's one right here, it sometimes dies. But you can see here examples of these granular forms right here. The spirochete, you can see it moving like a spirochete. And when this breaks down, these little uh, granular forms are actually released. And when the macrophage, since in, in the body, it has nowhere to escape. In the mouth, it can escape through a draining fistula and be gone. But anywhere else in the body, it can't escape. So these little granular forms actually vegetate and form more, uh, more spirochetes. There's a cyst form up there or spore-like form up there. So this is what happens when you treat spirochetes with penicillin. This is a slide. This is a Lyme disease spirochete. And penicillin is coming from your left to the right, from bottom to top. You can see the flow of the, sometimes you can see the little things going by, but this is a dilute penicillin. And this is what happens to spirochetes when you treat them with an antibiotic. They react and then they roll up into that. We call it a circular form or spore-like form, uh, round form, there's several names for them. This is actually, while it's happening. This is completely unknown to medicine. Dentists don't know anything about it, physicians don't. The fact is when you ask a physician what's the primary organism in the mouth that gets out of balance, they'll give you everything. Only one physician out of about 100 would gave me the right answer, which is spirochetes. I'm just going to go over some of these spore-like forms where we find them. And there was one textbook back in 1960 that actually described them and how they revegetate after uh, we'll put in a favorable medium, they'll revegetate to the to the regular uh, spiral form. Here's um, high magnification. This 1948 scanning micrograph. Uh, this is Wolf's work from Germany, how she actually did frozen section and showed how they morph into the circular form. Then here's uh, actually the the clinician here, the the main researcher is Chang. And uh, he's got dark field and face contrast showing these same spore-like forms. And this is Dasper. And uh, 
these big, these large, larger, these are bacteria, they're Porphyrmorus gingivalis, but the smaller ones are these small circular forms. In fluorescent spectroscopy, they show these round forms that light up the same way the spirochetes were. And there's been research done since that actually have taken these and, and forced them into the spore form and then uh, put them in a medium that's favorable and they actually uh, turn back into the spirochete after a short amount of time. And also you find this happens to be immune cell uh, in the bloodstream. You find the round forms there. Um, this is the blood vessel, this red blood cell, and then there's one of them right there. Uh, this is uh, just plaque. Oh no, this is just blood, blood sample, and they're free. They run free in the bloodstream as well. And it's when you're studying the blood, this is how you find the spirochetes. They're not in their regular helical form. These are the uh, Isles of Langerham. We're gonna talk about diabetes later. And this is samples that I have published where we find these in the sloughed epithelial cells that you find in the plaque samples. And when patients have severe periodontal diseases, you'll find just low, the, the epithelial cells, they're non immune cells. The spirochetes actually invade the immune cells and then they turn into the circular forms and then stay there until whatever treatment you've done. And then uh, over time, they re reformulate into the spiral form and then that's recurrence of the periodontal disease. The significance as far as DASPER is concerned is that's the reservoir, the gingival sulcus epithelial lining is where these things hide once you do your periodontal treatment. And as soon as the periodontal treatment's over and the antibiotics is done a few weeks later, they just revegetate and um, recontaminate the gingival sulcus. So one of the research that I did was on patients who had severe periodontal disease. And then I'd get samples before and after antibiotic treatment. And this is when I discovered the, that most of them will turn to spore form when you, chant, when you treat with antibiotics. And I got hundreds of these cases where these are the spore-like forms that you find subsequent to flagell, moxicillin or flagell and doxycycline, two weeks worth, 300 milligrams each for three weeks. And yet you'll find these spore-like forms everywhere, but no, no spiral forms. So this is, um, I got some atherosclerotic plaque from one of my patients and uh, we put it under microscope and lo and behold, as I predicted, I would see in the atherosclerotic plaques, you see these spore-like forms. The significance of this material just presented in part one is that this explains what the problem is with severe periodontal disease. It involves spirochetes, which are the same type of bacteria that cause syphilis and Lyme disease and cannot be taken lightly. Dr. Nordquist's first two books, The Stealth Killer and The Silent Saboteurs, relates periodontal disease, syphilis, and Lyme disease as similar diseases with identical symptoms. These two books can be found on Amazon. When a severe overpopulation of spirochetes is detected using a high-powered microscope, the diagnosis is severe uncontrolled periodontal disease. The treatment of this serious life-threatening condition is simple. A reset button needs to be hit and the overpopulation and complete imbalance of oral bacteria must be eliminated, and a new balance of microbes must be cultivated. Dr. Nordquist uses a CO2 laser to accomplish this task. Then the rebalancing task is commenced. This includes oral hygiene instructions to keep the mouth healthy and conducive to growing a healthy bacteria environment. Diet and lifestyle changes are taught, exercise programs are implemented, and education is begun teaching natural medicine and health. This combines natural medicine and non-invasive dentistry. For some patients, it represents drastic changes to reverse the years of health abuse. But, in the long run, long-term health is restored and healthy living can be achieved. This concludes part one of the lecture. Be sure to find part two which will be uploaded soon. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Nordquist. That was a highly uh, interesting presentation that I think gave us all a lot to think about. Thank you again for, Dr., uh, for speaking with us tonight. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. We will see you next month for next month's webinar. Good night, everyone. Thank you.